Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, there's a, there's a Chinese proverb that says, if you know your enemies and know yourself, you can win a hundred battles without a loss. If you only know yourself but not your opponent, you may win or you may lose. And if you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will always endanger yourself. You know, we are in a battle. We are in a fight. You know, Greg has been talking the last uh, four weeks about this idea of fight club, of, of, of spiritual warfare, the fact that we are in a battle, whether we realize it or not, whether we see it or not, the battle is there. And, and we need to be ready to fight. And so he's, t he's talked the last four weeks just on this subject. And he started off talking about Jesus, our commander, you know, our, our leader, and, and the fact that, that he went and he stripped the enemy of his power. He went and, and he stripped him of all authority. And the fact that if we have Jesus living inside us, that we are in a position of victory because of what Jesus did. And then he also talked about uh, power, the power that we have to, to battle the enemy. And so it's important for us, as the proverb says, it's important for us to know our enemy. Because if we don't know who our enemy is, if we're not ready, then we are going to be putting ourselves in danger. And so today, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to wrap up our series Fight Club today, and we're going to be talking about the fact that we need to know our enemy. And so who is our enemy? I think if we look back at the passage we just listened to in Ephesians 6, uh, Ephesians 6.12 gives us a, a very concise definition, I think, of, of who we are fighting, of who our, our enemy, our opponent is. And it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now take a look at that first verse. I think there's something really, uh, really, or the first sentence in that verse, really, really important for us to know, is that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We don't fight against people. We don't fight against uh, the, 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 the world, in, in the, the people in the world. You know, we don't, we don't fight against the drug dealers, the pornographers, uh, the, the abortionists, the, the corrupt politicians. We don't fight against those people, even though sometimes it seems like we need to. But when it comes down to it, that is not our enemy. Those people are not our enemy. Now, yes, they are responsible for their choices, and, and there is a right and wrong. There is a truth, and God is that truth. And so we know that there is a right and wrong, but they are not the enemy. They are not the enemy. Who is the enemy? Who is the enemy? You know, we really have to realize, you know, that's, that's sometimes how I feel. That's sometimes how I feel. Like I've got to scream and shout and yell and make somebody understand that they're wrong. It's just not the way it works, right? That's not the way it works. We need to, we need to expose the enemy for who it is. And if we're going to do that, we'll look at that verse. Uh, back at that verse, Ephesians uh, uh, 6.12, it says that, we fight against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil. Now, when it says, when it says rulers and authority, we're, uh, we're not talking about, like, presidents and governors and, and, and people here. That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about uh, a spiritual battle. These are spiritual rulers and authorities in this world. We are fighting a spiritual battle, and our battle is against spiritual forces. And so when we look at this verse, we can see that, that it really shows us a few things about our enemy. The, the first thing I, th I think it shows us, whoops, first thing I think it shows us is that there's a lot. There is a lot of them. You look at, you look at that verse, uh, rulers, authorities, powers of, the dark, of this dark world, spiritual forces of evil, um, th they're numerous. 
right? There, there's a lot of them. And, and, and really, what does it all mean? What, what do these things mean? I don't know. I'm being honest. I don't know. We could pick this verse apart. We could pick this verse apart and figure out what every, everything in that verse means. But in all honesty, I think for us today, it's important to realize that we have an opponent who is organized, right? We have an opponent who, there's, there's a hierarchy there. There, there is a level of, of authority within it. And so we're not, we're not just fighting against bumbling morons. We're, we're fighting against uh, spiritual beings that, that are organized and powerful. And that really leads me to the second thing I think we see from this verse is that they are powerful. That, that, that they're not just like Casper the friendly ghost, right? They're not just trying to, you know, play tricks on you or move dishes around on the table or something. They are real and they have one dangerous purpose, and that is to destroy us. That's what they want. And then I think the third thing we see from this verse is that they are evil. They are evil. They are opposed to God and everything holy and pure. And so they are opposed to us. If we follow God, if we live out God's life for us, then they are opposed to us, and they will come after us. So if we're going to look at our enemy. And, and who our enemy is and really study our enemy, there really is one opponent that we're warned about over and over and over as being our chief enemy. And that is Satan, the devil, right? Lucifer, whatever, whatever you want to call him. He is kind of our, our chief enemy. And we can see that, that Jesus talks about him actually in Matthew 13. Uh, we see that Matthew 13, that whole chapter is just a series of parables. Just Jesus teaching, using stories uh, to teach about the kingdom of God and about salvation and faith. Uh, and, he, and he tells a whole, uh, a whole series of parables. You've got the sower, you've got the weeds, uh, the mustard seed and the yeast, uh, and, and so on. And it's, it really is a great chapter. I mean, really just to take that chapter and read it, it's very challenging because when, when Jesus talks about stuff, you know, some of the stuff just pops right, at, right in there and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But then other stuff, it's like, what? What, what are you talking about? And really, the disciples were pretty lucky because when they felt like that, they could just go up to Jesus and say, hey, I didn't get that. <laughs> Can you explain that to me? And so in the course of explaining uh, about one of the parables, he talks about the devil. So there's a parable about uh, a farmer who is sowing some seeds. He's, he's planting wheat. Uh, and so he does that. And then in the night, uh, the, an enemy comes and plants some weeds in the field. And he's really trying to, to, to sabotage the harvest. And so the dis disciples say, I didn't get that. What does that mean? And so in the course of explaining the parable, Jesus says, well, the farmer is the son of man. The farmer is Jesus. And then the wheat, the, the good harvest, that is the people of God. But then he says in Matthew 13, 38 and 39, he says, the weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. He is our enemy. He is actively working against what God is trying to do. That is, that is his desire. That is, that is his purpose in life. And so we need to understand that we need to understand that, that Satan is not just some character from Looney Tunes, right? Like the, the, the red guy with the pointy horns and the pointy tail and the pitchfork. You know, that's what, I, that's what I grew up with every time I saw Satan on like a cartoon or something. That's what you see. You know, some sort of ruler in hell, and, and he's in charge of it all. But that's really not quite right. We look at 1 Peter 5, 8, and it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. This is not some cartoon character we're fighting. This is a very real opponent that we have. And Jesus says that he is our primary, our, our, our primary enemy. And, and, and Paul is telling us that he wants to devour us. Satan is out for blood, right? Satan is out for blood, and, and, and we need to be uh, living on guard. You know, it says, it says be sober mindful, be, be watchful. Now, I want to point out, it doesn't say be afraid. It doesn't say live your life in fear. I'm not saying that we have to cower in the corner, wondering when Satan's going to attack and what he's going to do. That's not what it says. It says be watchful. You need to be watching. You need to be waiting. But you don't need to be afraid. You need to be on your guard. So if we're going to look at Satan, if we're going to examine him, I think there's a really great passage in the Old Testament in Ezekiel that tells us actually a lot about Satan. 
It's found in Ezekiel 28, it's verses 11 through 15. Now, if you guys want to pull out your Bibles or if you've got your Bible on your phone or your tablet or something, you could do that and, and follow along with me. But there's some really interesting things about this passage that I'm going to pull out. But we're going to read it through starting in verse 11. It says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, This is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. A carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Now I want you to look at that. This is not about just a king. You know, th there's no way that this, is, that this is just about some mere king. It says you were in Eden. You were anointed as a guardian cherub on the holy mount of God. That's not, that's not some mor mere mortal man, right? That really, most Bible scholars believe that this is a parallel. This is using the fall of Satan to describe the fall of the king of Tyre. And so when we look at these verses, we, we see that it's really describing what Satan is like. Most of us really have this idea that he's like the, just this dark, disgusting thing that, that's going to come at us and, and, and we're going to see him coming from a mile away. And, and that's just not true. That's just not true. When, when, we actually, when we actually look at these verses, uh, we see that Satan is wise and beautiful. We look in verse 12, we see that Satan is, is wise and beautiful. This is really kind of a direct contrast to the, to the bumbling cartoon idiot that we see, right? Satan is smart. Satan is wily. Satan is out to get you. And he's going to use everything that he can to do it. Because he doesn't want you to know the truth. He wants you to believe the lie. He wants you to believe the lie that, that you're going to see him coming, that, that it's just going to be easy to spot him. He wants you to believe that because we see in uh, 2 Corinthians 11:14 14, it sees Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. You know, he's, he is a deceiver. He is, he is out to make you think that he's good. Because in all honesty, I think a lot of times we have a hard time equating uh, this, this idea of beauty with evil. But that's exactly what Satan is. He is beautiful and he is evil. He is deceitful. You know, Jesus says, John 8, 44, says he is a liar and the father of lies. He is the source of lies. He is the source of, of, of all of our lies. He comes, he comes to deceive us. He comes to, to, to just nudge us this way and that. He's not coming full bore. He's going to come sneaky. and He's going to come and try to get you. And so we need to ask a couple questions. We need to ask, I think, two questions really that are important for us to ask when we look at Satan. The first one we need to ask is, what is Satan trying to do in my life? If we are going to be ready for him, if we are going to know our opponent, we have to know what he is trying to do. And what Satan is trying to do is get us off track. He's trying to pull us off of God's plan for our lives. He wants to keep us from doing God's will and living the life that he has for us. He is actively working to destroy what God has created. Jesus tells us that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He wants destruction. That is what he wants most of all. And the weapons he uses are lies and distractions and condemnation and destruction and false teachings. And he will take every opportunity he sees, every open door that he gets, he will go for it if we're not on our guard. Now, like I said before, I'm not saying that we need to live in fear. I'm not saying that we need to be afraid of Satan, but we need to be on our guard. You know, a lot of people see Satan as some sort of evil counterpart to God, like some sort of all-knowing, all-seeing being that's just the evil, evil version of God. But it's not true. It's not true. We see in Job, the, the, the book of Job, all through the book of Job, we see that, that Satan constantly has to submit to God's authority. And we see this especially in, in Job 1.6, where Satan comes, and he actually has to give an account of what he's doing to God. He's not coming to God as an equal. 
he's coming to God as a subordinate. He's coming to God as, as someone who has to follow his rules. And so throughout that book of Job, we see that there's nothing that Satan does that he doesn't do without God's uh, approval, without God's uh, permission or authority. There is no authority that Satan has that God hasn't given to him. Now, that's not to say that God is causing Satan to do evil things. But it is to say that any authority that Satan has, God has given to him. And so we need to, we need to watch out. We need to, we need to be aware that, that we don't unwittingly open these, these, these uh, doors so that Satan can gain influence in our lives. We need to be on our guard. We need to know, uh, we ne- we need to know what Satan is trying to do. And the second question I think we need to ask is, how does Satan attack me? Because in all honesty, he's going to attack you different from me, right? He's going he's to use different things to get to you than he will to get to me. Now, I think this is really important for us to understand because Satan doesn't come to us with like a nice name tag. Hello, my, my name is Lucifer, right? He doesn't come and say, I'm, I'm here to steal, kill, destroy. I want to take your life. I want to take your family. I want to take your influence. And I want to destroy it. I want to take your life. He doesn't do that. I mean, how easy would that be? Because then we could just boot him out and say, no way, no thanks, go on. And we move on with our lives. But he does not do that. Think of how he tempted Eve in the garden. Think of the way he, he went after her. He didn't, he didn't just come out and say, uh, he, he didn't just come out and say that uh, uh, she, needs to, she needs to do this, you need to eat this. No, he said, well, why can't you, why does God say this? Why does God say that? Just planting little seeds of doubt, causing her to question God. And that's how he's going to come after us too, right? That's how he's going to come after us. He's, g- he's going to say, oh, it's okay to be angry. You have every right to be angry. Go ahead and say whatever you want because they deserve it. Hmm. Or, or, or maybe, maybe, th- maybe he'll say, you know, come on, that website's not that bad. Just one more click. It's okay. Right? Or, or, or maybe, maybe he'll say, there's really no right or wrong. It's whatever's right for you. You've got to decide. Or maybe, maybe he'll say, go ahead. It's not gossip because it's a prayer request. Right? He's going to come at us with little things, little things, little ways that, that we don't expect, little ways to, to, uh, to entice us to anger or lust or gossip or dishonesty or profanity, these little things that he's going to do. And he's going to do it when we least expect it. You know, this reminds me of the story uh, uh, of a couple shopping in a mall. You know, and, and this, this young, young woman comes by with a really sh- short skirt, and the guy's eyes just kind of follow her. And, and, and the wife, you know, without even looking up from the item she's looking at, the wife says, was it worth the trouble you're in? Mm. Was it? I mean, seriously, you've got to be ready for these things because they're going to come when you don't expect it. You've got to think through. You've got to realize that the temptation will be there when you're off your guard. I love what Tim Tebow says. Now, he's not the first person to say this, I know, uh, but, but he said this. Whoops. He said this. He said, if I've already thought through a situation and have a response prepared ahead of time in the event temptation rears its ugly head, it's that much easier to resist. Right? We need to think through. We need to think through. Like I said, he's not the first person to think of this, but we need to understand that there's merit in what he says. We need to think through what our response is going to be when we're tempted because the very real uh, truth is that we will be tempted, and we need to be we need to be careful that we're not caught off guard. So, really, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do with this? What does God expect from us, and 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 how do we really combat Satan? And I think Greg gave us a really good start with this. You know, last the last couple weeks we were looking at uh, Acts one eight says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know, he took that word power and he made an acronym and, and, and gave us five tools that we have in spiritual warfare. And so we looked at the, the P. The P stood for praise. You know, he talked about the fact that it's not about the fruit, it's about the root. Yes, thank you. Somebody's listening. It's not about the fruit, it's about the root. It's not about the songs and the clapping and the hands raising. It's about uh, proclaiming the merit and worth of God. That is praise. And then the O was oppose. The fact that we need to get down off the fence, we need to pick a side, and we need to take a stand and oppose the enemy. 
and the fact that uh, the W, the word, that is our weapon. The word of God is our weapon in this battle. And E is engaged. We need, to, we need to step out and actually engage the enemy. We need to be light and salt and truth and love in this world. And then the R, R stood for rebuke. And that's, that's rebuking the enemy, setting prisoners free through the blood of Jesus. And I think if we're looking at that, those are great tools that we have in, in, this, in this battle that we are in. But I think if we want to take it further, we look back at the passage we started with. You know, we started with Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the spiritual realm. That is who we are fighting. And then it continues on in, in Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, pick up the full armor of God so that you can stand your ground on the evil day and after you have done everything possible to still stand. We're supposed to be ready for the tax. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to get ourselves ready for this battle. This whole passage is military, right? This whole passage is military. And, and could you imagine soldiers marching into battle, carrying their armor next to them, waiting for the arrows to start flying before they put it on? That'd be dumb, right? That would be stupid. You know, having their flak jackets on the side, waiting for the bullets to get them. Oh, and then I'll put it on, right? No, they, they put it on well before they're in the battle. Way when they're still safe they put on their armor. When they're still safe, they get ready for battle, and that's what we need to do. We need to get ourselves ready before we're in the battle. Otherwise, we're going to be caught by surprise, and we're going to get hurt. You know, this really makes me think of sports, right? It makes me think of uh, football coaches that spend hours upon hours upon hours studying footage of not just their own team, but their opponent's team, right? They're, they're studying their opponent's team, trying to figure out where their weak spots are. You know, for example, if they have, if, if one side of their defense is weak, then they're going to focus their plays on that side and trying to, try to exploit that weakness. And we need to do the same thing. We need, to, we need to look at our enemy. We need to examine how he attacks. We need to examine him so that we are ready and we know his weak spots when those attacks come. We need to be ready to deal with whatever he will dish out. And so really all of this might seem kind of discouraging because I spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the attacks that will come and how powerful Satan is and this and that. And I don't want you to leave with that because I, I, I don't think it's true. What's the point? You know, so many people say, what's the point? Satan's going to attack. He's going to get me. Whatever. What's the point? And I don't want you leaving like that. I don't want you leaving with that because, sure, Satan is real. Yes, he's active. He's evil. He's deceptive. He's powerful. But Satan is defeated. Satan has been defeated. He's done. And Greg talked about this the very first week. Now, if you missed this, if you missed the first week of this series, you need to go back. You need to watch it from the beginning because he covered this in the very first week, the fact that Jesus went and he stripped that power away so that our enemy ha no longer has any power or authority over us because we have the, we have the spirit of victory living inside us. And so just to kind of leave you, I have a few verses that I want to leave you with that, that kind of help encourage me when, when times get tough, okay? And I want to leave you with just these uh, few verses. The first verse here is 1 John 4, 4. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You know, sometimes it doesn't seem like this. Sometimes I look at it and I look at the world and I see all the problems and all the things going wrong and everything that I want to change and, and everything that we're fighting against and I wonder how we can be victorious, right? But you have to remember, you have to remember back to the first verse we looked at. Our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We are not fighting against this. We are fighting against the spiritual forces are, that are in this world. And until we start doing that, until we, until we stop fighting people and start fighting who we're supposed to fight and start fighting the true enemy, then this will never end, right? This will never end. It's never going to stop until we start to focus on the true enemy. And when we do that, then we realize that the one who is in us truly is greater than the one who is in the world. The next verse I want to share with you, James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I have always kind of liked this verse because I think that first part of the verse is, is, is slightly funny, uh, humorous to me. Because when I think about it, you know, whether I want to or not, I am under God's authority. 
right? I am under, whether I submit or not, God is in authority over me. And so really, when I look at that, it, it, it makes me laugh. It's just kind of an inside joke, I guess, into my own head. Uh, but, uh, but, but really, you know, when we look at that verse, we see that submit in that sense means to obey, to live out your life according to what God wants for you. But that's not really the part that I wanted to focus on. Uh, the part I wanted to focus on was uh, the part that says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The point I really want to make is that he is a coward, right? He will come after you. He wants to get you, but he is a coward. He will run away. If you resist him, if you have the armor of God on, he will run away. He will flee from you. He's sneaky, he's wily, but he's not invincible. And you have to remember that. He will run away if you stand firm against him. And then the last verse, Revelations 12, 11. They triumphed over him, and, and the him in this verse is Satan. They triumphed over Satan by the blood of the Lamb. You know, our victory, it's never instantaneous. It's never easy. It's never quick. It's going to come with struggle. It's going to come with sweat and sacrifice. But we have to remember that Satan has already been defeated. And so as we wrap up this series, I want to leave you that. I want to leave you with what we started the series out with. We started this series out with the fact that our enemy has already been defeated. This war has already been won, and we're just fighting the battles now. And so today, I want to leave you with the fact that the enemy has no authority over you. If you have the Spirit of God living inside you, the enemy has no authority and no power over you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this day and, and for what you teach us and the fact that your word is, is alive, living, and active today. And Lord God, I pray that as we go about our week that we would start to prepare ourselves for the temptations that will come. As we go about our week that we would start to, start to look to what Satan is going to do and what he's trying to do and be ready for that. And God, I pray that we would be victorious in the battles that we have. I give this to you, and I thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen.